I'm Crystal Collins Judd, the president of Sarah Lawrence College, and I am so pleased to welcome you all here to tonight's lecture by Jill Lepore. We are delighted this year that we are in collaboration, Sarah Lawrence and the Bronxville Historical Conservancy on tonight's lecture. This year at Sarah Lawrence, we have a series called E Pluribus Unum, as we explore that notion of our country's motto, out of many, one. What does that mean for us now? What does that mean at this time? What does it mean for us as a college? And as we thought about that series that's ongoing this year, we thought there was no one better than Jill Lepore to be a speaker in that series. Many of you know Marilyn Hill is on the Sarah Lawrence board and part of the Bronxville Historical uh, Conservancy. And at some point, months and months ago, Marilyn said, you know, Jill Lepore is the person we must have for the Brendan Gill lecture. So at that point, we said, let's make these things align. So we've been delighted to have Jill on campus this afternoon, meeting with faculty and students and talking with them. And now for tonight's lecture. Um, so we are so pleased with the alignment that we at the college could collaborate with the Historical Conservancy. And I want to ask Bill Zambelli, the co-chair of the Bronxville Historical Conservancy, to now join us. As a president, you introduce the introducers. Welcome to Sarah Lawrence. <laughs> Good evening, and, and thank you for joining us on this uh, rather bleak, rainy night. I want to welcome you on behalf of the Bronxville Historical Conservancy to the 22nd annual Brendan Gill Lecture, tonight featuring prize-winning author and historian Dr. Jill Lepore. I'm Bill Zambelli, and I have the honor of serving as co-chair, along with Dale Walker of the Conservancy this year. Our mission is to foster an awareness of Bronxville's architectural, artistic, and cultural heritage, and to lend support to projects designed to strengthen and preserve those legacies through lectures, tours of historic homes, boat trips, recognition awards, and community events such as Ghosts of Bronxville and Building Bronxville with Legos. We also continue to add to our excellent collection of art by noted Bronxville artists on display in Village Hall and the Bronxville Library. We invite you to consider membership in the Conservancy and help us to celebrate and preserve our history and heritage. I do want to extend my thanks this evening to members of the Conservancy Board for their extensive behind the scenes efforts in making this evening a success. And a very special thanks to Sarah Lawrence President, Dr. Crystal Judd, and the staff at Sarah Lawrence for making their beautiful campus facilities available to us and providing logistical support in any number of ways. I, all, I would also like to recognize Dr. John Nunes, president of Concordia College. Concordia also serves as one of our partners in bringing the Brendan Gill Lecture to you each year. After tonight's presentation, we will entertain questions from the audience. Raise your hand and a microphone will be brought to you. Uh, please keep your questions brief and we will try to get to as many as time permits. Also, please join us afterwards here in uh, Reisinger for a reception and an opportunity to meet our guest speaker. I would now like to invite Marilyn Hill, co-founder of the Conservancy, to introduce our 2020 Brendan Gill uh, lecturer. Thank you. Thank you. Jill, I don't want to disturb your lecture here. <clears throat> We're honored tonight to have as our Brendan Gill speaker an extraordinarily gifted historian and writer, Jill Lepore. Her prominence has been achieved in both <clears throat> the academic and public literary worlds. Jill has said that from the time she was six, she knew she wanted to be a writer, but her path from that early desire to becoming the David Woods Kemper professor of American history at Harvard, a nationally recognized historian, and a staff writer at The New Yorker was not as certain or direct as you might have thought. Lepore was born and grew up in West Boylston, a small town outside Worcester, Mass. Her father was a junior high school principal and her mother was an art teacher. Lepore described herself as a difficult, rotten teenager and said that she wasn't even sure she wanted to go to college. Being the last child in her family, however, 
a position that allowed her to be the focus of parental attention and nudging. Uh, she applied to only one college and enrolled in Tufts on an ROTC scholarship, starting as a math major while playing on the field hockey team. Eventually, her, she left the ROTC and changed her major to English. Part of that decision to make the change was because of a letter from home that her mother had forwarded to her, a letter that Jill had written to herself in a high school time capsule type exercise, a letter that was to be opened in four years. Later, <clears throat> or her 14-year-old harangue to her future self assumed she had become a wasto with no passions and doing nothing worthwhile or anything that she loved. Jill decided her 14-year-old self was right, and so she changed her future course, but without her ROTC scholarship, she needed to move faster through her degree program, so she earned her BA in English in three years. <clears throat> After Tufts, Lepore had a temporary job working as a secretary at Harvard Business School, <clears throat> while also auditing some courses there in history. She then returned to a degree program, receiving an MA in American Culture from the University of Michigan in 1990, and then her PhD in American Studies from Yale in 1995, specializing in the history of early America. Lepore taught at the University of California, San Diego from 1995 to 1996, and at Boston University in 1996. She was offered a position at Harvard in 2003 in History and Literature, a department that she has chaired, and she is still there in the history department, continuing her teaching while writing and publishing a dozen books she has so far. In 2005, she also began writing for The New Yorker. She currently lives in Cambridge with her husband and three sons. There's not enough time to itemize her extraordinary career and all of her awards and achievements, so I will try to summarize. Her dozen published books, which include a historical novel, were lauded from the beginning in 1999 with her first book receiving the Bancroft Prize, the Phi Beta Kappa Emerson Prize, and the Berkshire Prize, all in one year. Since then, she has not missed many years publishing a book or being nominated for or winning another of 14 awards, including the American History Book Prize, being a Pulitzer Prize finalist twice, as well as a finalist for a Penn Literary Award and a Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Nonfiction. In addition, Lepore has been honored by being chosen to deliver nine honorary lectures at esteemed universities and colleges, such as Yale, Princeton, and Harvard, lectures that seem mostly to be named after deceased old men. And we hope that you, Jill, will add to that published list the Conservancy's Brendan Gill lecture at Sarah Lawrence College. Lepore's history colleagues also have chosen her to head their national uh, professional organizations, such as the Society of American Historians. At Harvard, according to the Harvard Crimson newspaper, there is a campus cult of Lepore, made up of students and faculty who revere and adore her and who wish to be a part of her popular courses as either a student or as a co-teacher. The Crimson reporter who interviewed uh, Lepore described her office as an archive of sorts filled with abandoned objects such as old theater seats and newspapers, an office space <clears throat> that Jill calls her Harry Potter closet under the stairs. According to the writer, the room is leaking books they're crowded onto the dark brown shelves that line her walls, stacked vertically, horizontally, and at angles, vying for space, certainly not in alphabetical order. They form precarious piles on the edges of her desk, but if they tip, no matter, they'll only join piles on the floor. Lepore holds what she calls walking office hours, where you hike around campus discussing your issues, a practice perhaps created because there's no place to sit in the office. Whatever the reason, she is in great demand. When you think of all the accomplishments, you can't help but be impressed. But to put it in perspective, this woman is barely 50 years old, a fact that gives me what I call my maternal psychological jolt, because that puts her in the same age group as my little children. Not that mine 
aren't, of course, fantastic offspring, but the idea that those young people are running the world throws me a little bit. And, and that's not very many years to accomplish all that she has accomplished. My older daughter is a huge Jill Lepore fan, and in anticipation of tonight, I wrote her and asked her to send me her favorite Lepore New Yorker articles and asked that they be sent in separate emails with the online reference I could just click. She sent me three, and then 45 more emails followed in quick succession. I finally sent back a note in bold caps and said that she might want to be more selective and just send me her favorites. Her answer was, I know I have sent you a lot of articles, but probably only one-fourth of what I could have. Truth be told, she is so brilliant and so prolific that I could have sent you every single one she's ever written for The New Yorker, all of which I've read and loved, and of all of which you should read and would love. Lepore must most recent book, These Truths, has been one of the leading topics in literary conversations in the last year and is said to be the most ambitious one-volume American history in decades. Over 900 pages packed with evidence and fascinating interpretation. As one person quipped, this year we didn't need a summer reading list, only one book. We started it in June and finished in August. <laughs> to be serious, however, <clears throat> Jill, her narrative histories are totally compelling as she searches for and presents, presents evidence of what has been missing from our past historical understanding. But rather than try to expand on her methodology, I'm going to turn the program over to the master historian herself, Jill Lepore. Um, thanks so much, Marilyn, for that lovely introduction. You know, the measure of an introduction is whether it would embarrass even your mother. Um, my, mo <laughs> my mother would be embarrassed. Thank you. It was so beautiful. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming out this evening. I know there are lots of reasons to stay home uh, between the weather and the uh, coming health apocalypse. <laughs> um, it's really great to see you all out here this evening. And I, I want to thank the Conservancy for the invitation and Crystal and Sarah Lawrence as well, and all the, the students who are here and faculty who, uh, some faces I recognize from the session earlier this afternoon. Can people hear me with this as I walk around? Okay, if it gets to the point where you can't hear me, because sometimes I start mumbling, just wave at me and I'll, and I'll adjust that. I, I hate it when it turns out people couldn't really hear what I was saying. Um, so again, it's, it's delightful to be here. Thanks uh, all for coming out. What I wanted to do this evening was try to explain a little bit about why I decided to write this very, very long book. I've never written a very, very long book before, and I decided that it was worthwhile to do the work and ask readers to do the work of you know, slogging through a thousand-page history of the United States at a time when the acceleration of our news and our forms of online communication mean that it's very difficult to take the time to read such a long book. It really does take from June to August to read the book. I did the audio edition of the book. I read it out loud in the in a recording studio. It took me like four weeks just to read the thing out loud. And I was being paid to do it as a full-time job. So the idea that people spend the time, I recognize what a commitment it is. But I really very much thought that um, as an intervention in the very evanescence of our contemporary political moment and a sense that the, the past is forever kind of vanishing behind us. Um, what seems like a, a, a news item today, tomorrow will, have, will seem ancient to us. Wh whether there was something about writing a big book that could be a kind of antidote to that sense of we're always just spinning our wheels around. Um, so I wrote this very long book and then I agreed to do these wonderful talks at events like this. And how am I supposed to communicate a thousand page book to you in 45 minutes? I never wanted to sort of pick a piece of the book and tell a little story because the whole commitment was about needing to slow down and think about the very big picture. So what I'm going to do this evening is in fact try to cover all of American history in 45 minutes in a kind of, um, if anyone's ever seen the complete abridged works of William Shakespeare, uh, 
I can't be as antic as that, but a little, with a little bit of that spirit, that, that we, would, we would gain something, really, by kind of working through a whole long stretch of time. Because I want us to think a little bit about change over time. So the way I'm going to do that is um, by using images. So I want to begin, though, with a little bit more framing before I turn to the images that are going to take us across the centuries, to suggest that we live in an age that is very dense with historical argument. But the uh, historical arguments that we encounter day to day are um, very uh, limited in their interpretation because they really work as political arguments. So make America great again is a historical argument. It's a very concise and precise historical argument in just four words or this, the future is nasty, is a very uh, concise historical argument. We, ha we live in a political culture where our widely polarized uh, political conversations are themselves all historical arguments. They're just highly reductivist historical arguments. I think this is a real problem for our political culture. It's certainly a real problem for us as a democracy. So think about, for instance, the Tea Party movement, the way that it figured itself um, as a turning toward the past, uh, an attempt to, to worship again and to revere um, a sense of the falling, the lack of reverence of the founding fathers, that Barack Obama represented a betrayal of the nation's past, was a really crucial piece of, of the, the, the iconography of the Tea Party movement. Whereas the Obama campaign, its, its entire argument was about change and looking forward, right? Not at all about looking backward. What we don't need to do is to look back again. We're backwards, we need to look forward at all times. The Tea Party argued, <laughs> the Tea Party's response was, we shall stop change. Um, so I'll just say that we have these, this very highly um, schismatic, approach to the past. People are making historical arguments all the time, but they're just kind of warmed over political arguments. They're not actually telling us anything. Change we need and stop change don't actually tell us anything about the past. They just assume that we all agree about the difference between the past and the present and the future. Um, this is the p one poster that I really agree with. Um, I spent a lot of time going to political rallies and studying iconography. I guess my point would be like, I just am not interested in resurrecting the past to make a historical argument that is fundamentally politics by other means. So that's one of the reasons that I decided that it was necessary to write the book. So what I want to do now, though, is try to give you a sense of change over time in the long arc of American history. I'm going to start over here. Imagine, <laughs> imagine this is the deep past. We're going to end up on the other end of the stage <laughs> by the time we get to the evening. We're going to work our way across this timeline and how I'm going to show you change over time is by looking at the way people in the place that we live have represented that place and their relationship to it. Because that is what we live. We live in a nation state, which is the glomming together of a political arrangement, a state, with a group of people, a nation. So how, we have a sense of what our nation state is and maybe what it isn't. But I want us to think about how we even got to that idea by looking at a series, a sequence of images. So I want to begin with the proposition that it is part of the human condition to attempt to represent ourselves graphically, to leave a trace behind. Right? This is from Argentina, these beautiful cave paintings. Almost this identical um, configuration is found in cave paintings all over the world. All human peoples all over the world have done these handprints, leaving a sense behind of who was here, uh, who we are. It's an artistic expression. It's a claiming a, of a sense of oneself as a people, the relationship of a people to a place. This is a thing that we do as humans. We could do this today, and it would be equally expressive. When your kid does a drawing of their hand um, and makes a turkey out of it at Thanksgiving, like, we leave marks behind. We attach ourselves to places um, by leaving those marks behind. And we can think about, um, we can follow these across time. I'm going to jump all the way up ahead. We were in 10,000 before the Common Era. We jump ahead to the 14th century. Um, this is just a beautiful illustration from an Aztec codex that is about the kind of search for the location of self in a world. It can be in a spiritual world, it can be a cosmological world, it can be a geographical world, but here's this, this central human figure in the middle of what is essentially like a compass rose, right? The four directions that this figure could be going in, the world that exists that surrounds this person who occupies this place. This, this kind of just, I think, really gorgeous, beautiful, moving 
compulsion that we have to try to, to reckon with where we are and who we are, right? That it, that it is essential to human civilization. We can jump ahead now to 1607, uh, about 1607. This is a, a, a mantle or cloak that's made out of four uh, deerskin hides stitched together. Um, and on them are embroidered tiny shells. Um, it's thought to have been worn by Powhatan, who uh, was Pocahontas's father, but was a leader of the Eastern Algonquin peoples. And the way this cloak communicates uh, the relationship between people and place, here we see a real important communication of rule. Powhatan was a ruler. So in this um, representation of this land in Virginia, or what the English would come to call Virginia, the animals on either side of him are his spirit guides, and these circles surrounding him are some 30 villages that he ruled over, that pay tribute to him. So it's, a, it's essentially a map of his realm, and it is also a kind of claim of his sovereignty and his rule. Um, so a much more complicated and really fascinating representation of the relationship between here a people, a ruler, and the place, the other people who are reduced um, to these different political units here as villages. Europeans, of course, had made all kinds of maps for a very, very long time. This map of the world is the very first map of the world that was ever printed. Um, it was actually created in the seventh century, um, but it was, uh, the printing press isn't in, invented until 14, the 1440s, so it's not printed until 1472, but it actually represents a view of the world that Western Europeans had had for at least seven centuries. This map, it's actually deeply ironic that like it finally is printed in, 17, in 1472 and then it's obsolete. Like it's like the last possible moment you could think of the world this way if you were in Europe. Um, so it's kind of a bummer. But um, this is called a TO map and it is, it's a geographical map, um, but it is, and it doesn't have America on it obviously, um, but it's also a religious map. Um, it's a called a TO map because that's the shape that is in it. The, um, remember people didn't put north on the top uh, until fairly recently. So we have Europe over here, Asia, um, Africa, here's the Mediterranean, and here's the ocean that surrounds those parts of the world. It's a T for, it's a trinity. The world is divided into three perfect parts that are inhabited by the three sons of Noah, um, and the O is the, the, the perfection, the, the perfection of God. Um, this map was the prevailing way that Europeans understood theologically the shape of the world. They didn't understand the world. They knew that the world was a sphere. Um, this isn't like a flat earth proposition. But it represents a, a sense that the world has been made by this particular God in the form that reflects the arrangement that God wanted the world to make. Um, this map was made not very long afterwards, in 1507, by the German map maker Martin Waldsmuller. This is kind of hard to picture how big this, this map was maybe the size of half of this screen. It was basically wallpaper. These giant, 12 giant sheets that you would paste on to a wall. There's only one copy of this map that survives. It's at the Library of Congress. Because um, if you make something into wall, <laughs> wallpaper, it's not going to survive. But it was an extremely important, influential map. And it was also a popular map. People really wanted to own this map. Walter Mueller uh, was doing something really important and interesting with, you know, if he trying to do something um, that's mathematically a little complicated, but also complicated as a matter of printing. Um, you know, if you peel an orange and then you peel it in one piece and you flatten it out, you, you're going to have a projection of a sphere. He's, he's doing a mathematical projection here um, that he derived from the ancient Greeks and in particular from Ptolemy, who's this mathematician who's honored here, who comes up with this means of, of uh, projecting the surface of a sphere uh, onto, onto, a flat, onto a flat surface. Um, so this is a map that's doing something that is deeply concerned with accuracy, with geographical accuracy. Um, it's also deeply fascinated with essentially breaking news, like the latest developments, the latest word from European explorers. What I love about it is this sort of after the fact, ooh, I have to add that, they, that we just rounded the Cape of Good Hope. <laughs> it's like a little bit, uh, a last minute thought. But one of the reasons this map is so important, probably the chief reason this map is so important, and the reason it's at the Library of Congress, 
uh, and not in a library in Germany, is that Waldseemuller knew about these voyages that Columbus had taken to this landmass that people understood and referred to after Columbus as the fourth part of the world. Columbus didn't understand that it was the fourth, but there were, if that world was in the tripartite map, there were three parts of the world. The fact that there was a fourth part just threw everything up in the air, and Walter was really, Walter was really interested in thinking about how to represent that and how accurately to depict it. He has no idea the size or shape of, of this landmass, but he's given it a huge prominence in the way that he puts it on this map. Um, it's not an afterthought. He hasn't crammed it into a TO. He's done something very different. And he was really influenced not by Columbus and Columbus's account of his voyages, but by the account offered by this guy who's also uh, honored on the map, Amerigo Vespucci. Because Amerigo Vespucci had gone to what comes to be called Brazil, and Amerigo Vespucci had decided that this was not, as Columbus thought, he had, he had just crossed you know, the, over, all the way over to Asia, but that this was a new world. And so Columbus published, Vespucci published a book called The New World, and it was translated into German, and Waldseemuller happens to have read it. And so on this map, when he adds for the first time this new landmass, having honored Amerigo Vespucci uh, as the person from whom he learned about it, he names this landmass America. It's the only reason why the, oh, the place where we live is referred to as America, is because of this single map and its extraordinary influence. Um, so thinking about, I've moved way across the stage. We're only in 1507. <laughs> Um, we're going to jump ahead a little bit to the year 1600, and I want to suggest to you that Vespucci, far more than Columbus um, in Western Europe, was uh, the iconographic representation of the age of exploration. I always think of this, so here's Vespucci, Amer Vespucci awakens a sleeping America, here obviously is America Vespucci, the same guy we just saw uh, on Waldseemuller's map. I always think of this as um, an illustration of how Vespucci was the Harvey Weinstein of the age of discovery. Um, it, it, I find it a very difficult engraving. It's a Dutch engraving from the year 1600. Uh, it's telling a story about the European discovery of America. Um, and I find it a troubling image. It's, it should be hard to look at this image um, because it's essentially, it's an image of rape, right? It's about, it's about a rape that's about to happen. And it's a celebration of that. Um, but one way to think about um, this graphic image is to divide it along a diagonal along here. Um, and then everything that's on the Vespucci side of the diagonal is representing the supremacy of Europe, right? So the, the clothing, the, there's, the, there's a, the technology, the sextant, the navigational capacities, religion and the cross, um, the, there are guns on the ship that we, we were, what is communicated to us, uh, the power of Christianity, or the, the, the accoutrements um, of European civilization and culture. Its capacities, its technologies, its, its ideologies are all celebrated here. And then everything on the other side of that diagonal represents um, the Americas, the indigenous peoples of the Americas, depicted here allegorically. America is um, a, a, a woman who is naked, who is prone, right? Where Europe is a standing man, America is a naked, prone woman. Um, the America that she is inhabiting is kind of a Garden of Eden. It's a paradise that's incredibly lush and fertile and wonderful and wild. Uh, there's, there's some sense that there, there is technology here, but it's a celebration of its primitiveness. Here's a, a canoe paddle, a, a hammock is also an indigenous technology. And, um, but it's very much about abundance. Like Europe is going to sow its seed in this fertile land. Um, this what's, what's going on here. But it is also an image of the taking of possession. And what's most important here then in this image, if you follow, actually it's the center point of the images is a scene way back here. Can you see this like a, like a, like a campfire? Um, it's a little hard to see here, but there's a, a human leg on a spit roasting over the fire. And the reason it's in so the, the central, like you, if you follow her hand, you get right there. Our attention is being drawn to that because Europeans had no, we might agree, there's, no, there's just not really an ethical claim to just take people's land, but they had no legal claim to take the, the possession of the lands um, that they voyaged to in the lands that they called the Americas. Um, Marco Polo traveled to China. He didn't claim China. Um, there's plenty of travels that Europeans do. They don't just say, oh, we found these people, we're taking their land. 
Um, but when Europe, so when Europeans wanted to take possession of the Americas, it was necessary for them to insist that they had a right to the land because the indigenous people had violated the law of nature because they were cannibals. So there are all these stories about the cannibalism of the indigenous peoples, but it is a necessary uh, legal loophole, essentially, that Europeans can use to, to make that claim. So it's a really different depiction um, of, of this place than that, than that map offers up. There's now we can see attached to the idea of America and the European imagination are all kinds of uh, commitments around possession. Uh, 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 the kind of a gendering of the idea of the country itself, um, a, a self, pres self presentation with regard to dominance. Um, this is a very different de depiction. This is Queen Elizabeth uh, the first in 1588, a portrait that's celebrating her reign. Um, and why I present this to you as a claim that this is about the land that. Uh, that we are standing on is, in 1588, the English had no colonies uh, in North America or in the Caribbean. Span this, this Spain, Portugal, Holland, France all had colonies, many of them thriving. Spain's New World Empire was vast, as was Portugal's. England had attempted to found a colony in Roanoke, and it had failed. But the queen here has her dainty little hand resting. Can you see what she's covering? It's, it's a globe, but quite specifically, her tiny little royal hand is taking all of North America. Like it's, this, this, it's a very similar image in a way to this <clears throat> claim of possession. I take these lands because you're savage. Like this is just, these are now mine, and also you're a woman, and so they're mine. Um, Queen Elizabeth's claim is a little bit different, but it's like, I'm the Queen of England, this stuff is mine. It's just no claim, no claim whatsoever regard, uh, with regard to the indigenous inhabitants of this place. But more specifically, <laughs> all those territories are claimed by other European countries. Like, she has no claim on them, but she is, she is communicating her vast ambition. Um, so it's a really different representation. Well, by the time we get to the 18th century, Probably the images I'm going to show you, will be, some of them will be more familiar to you, but I want to ask you to look at them anew, look at them afresh. People have probably seen this. This is an illustration, a political cartoon that appeared in Benjamin Franklin's newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette. 1754 was when uh, the colonies and the British and North American colonies got together. Uh, Franklin wanted them to form a union to defend uh, collectively against the French and Indians. He failed, like we didn't get that union, but as part of his campaign to argue for a defensive union of the colonies, he, he published this political cartoon. And a thing that's important, to, there's several things I want to call your attention to. Um, first of all, it's the first time we've seen an image of the Americas that doesn't show us all of the Americas. Um, now we're just actually looking at Britain's mainland colonies, um, and not even at all of them we're not looking at. Halifax and Nova Scotia. We're just looking at these specific British mainland colonies. What, what do they have to do with one another? But, and we're also understanding that they don't apparently have that much to do with one another because they're a severed snake. Um, but <clears throat> one way to think about this, in addition to as a political cartoon, it's a map and would have been read by people who, unlike you, probably can't see it as a map because north is not at the top. North is, north is over here, but we have New England, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina. It is actually a map of the Atlantic coast, roughly speaking. It's also something else, though. It's a jigsaw puzzle. And what I want to suggest to you is that that is, in fact, quite important. Map makers were the people who invented jigsaw puzzles because there was a great demand for maps during the age of European colonization of other parts of the world, because Europeans were laying claim to parts of the world and essentially cutting out you know, parts of uh, North and South America and saying, this part is mine, this part is Spain's, this part is Portugal's. Um, so map makers would print these maps, and then they would glue them onto wooden boards, and you could cut them up. Um, this is one of the very first maps Europe divided into its kingdom. And essentially, imagine that people would accept <clears throat> what is a legal fiction that you know France has boundaries that are there. France doesn't have bad like those, those. Most of those boundaries are they're just drawn on a map. But when you as if you could kind of cut out the land like wedding cake, 
it's that sensibility that comes across in Franklin's essentially, um, it's, they were called dissected maps. They weren't called jigsaw puzzles then. Um, it's dissected maps. These are really commonly made of the Americas because they were about Europeans making claims about the land. Um, that figure that I showed you in Vespucci Awakens a Sleeping America, that allegorical figure of America as a naked indigenous woman, you see her all over the place. So here she is in a political cartoon from the American Revolution. This, this figure, this naked native woman represents America. And um, again, she is being raped, um, which is a very common feature of political iconography. She, in this case, she's being raped by British tax collectors. This is a, a, a pro-patriot, anti-British political cartoon, but just an index for you of a kind of changing conception on the part of the British colonists who now come to perceive themselves as best represented, not by these guys, um, the European rapists, but by this woman. So really weird, um, freakish turn um, that, that you see the remnants of all, all over the place in our own contemporary visual iconography. I would suggest that by the time we get to 1787, remember we started really in 1607, that we could think about the Constitution as another, like those fingers, those hands on a wall, right? Like, this is our land. These are the rules by which we live. This is who we are. Constitution is a charter. It's a frame of government, but it is also a graphical representation of the people. We the people. We the people. This is our country. These are our rules. Um, it, 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 it is graphically, um, and it becomes iconographic for us. Um, in the 18th century, no one ever saw the manuscript version. We think of like the big calligraphic, you know, we the people as, as, as kind of iconic. Um, they thought of the printed version, which is how, how everybody saw it. No one saw the, except for the delegates of the Constitutional Convention. Um, by the time the Republic is founded though, there is already a rich tradition of indicting Americans for their hypocrisy. So this is a, um, a representation of America now not that indigenous naked woman, but a clothed American woman who's a European American woman who, who's the allegorical figure of liberty. So this is liberty here with her liberty cap. This is the liberty that becomes eventually the Statue of Liberty, that figure of liberty uh, is all over the place. You see this figure all over the place, but you don't really see her until after the uh, ratification of the Constitution. But this um, painting um, from 1792 is an indictment of liberty. Um, and an indictment of America for its failure to end slavery. So if you divide this painting along a diagonal as well, everything over here with liberty, you know, including the, the Roman and Greek temples, the, the world, the knowledge of the world, she has stacks of books, there's, you know, arts and letters and scientific knowledge, geographical knowledge, the world of literature, everything that you associate with um, the thriving republic and the capacity, human capacity and the extension of the human capacity by the founding of a republic and the celebration of liberty and bills of rights and the protections of liberties that will produce an incredible um, blossoming of the arts and sciences and diffusion of knowledge. It's an incredible celebration here of what America represents as the hope of mankind. But on the other side of the diagonal is the iconic representation of slavery. Uh, all the things that liberty has, none of them are extended to these people who are enslaved. And in fact, there's a counterpoint. This figure here is the allegorical representation of slavery. It's always <clears throat> an African-American woman with a kerchief who is the allegorical figure we don't have. We have a Statue of Liberty. If we had a Statue of Slavery, which thank goodness we don't, it allegorically would be that figure. Um, this sort of Aunt Jemima, like we have that figure as a, as, as, as a repulsive holdover from that era. But that is a, that you see that figure all the time in early American political uh, imagery and in early American art as well. So for instance here, this is a, Thomas Jefferson ran for re-election in 1804. Here's Thomas Jefferson, famous redhead as the philosophic cock. Um, this is a dark political joke about Jefferson. <laughs> it's a deep attack on Jefferson. It's an argument against reelecting him, in part by revealing that he is in an illicit liaison with Sally Hemings, who is both an actual person, a woman who was owned by Thomas Jefferson and who is the mother of six of his children, um, which was known to people at the time. It was an issue during his election and during his reelection. But she's also representing slavery allegorically here. That's a, is a very familiar figuring of what slavery is, is this 
this woman with a kerchief. So you know, when people say, oh, well, so they, you know, there was no real debate about slavery until the 1850s, there was a debate about slavery from day one. Um, and you can find it all over the place visually in, in the visual record of, of early America. Um, this, you'll say, well, how is that in a representation of America? We're now like in 1848, so <laughs> I'm going to stop here. So this is actually, um, it's called War News from Mexico, but it is a depiction of the United States um, at the end of the Mexican-American War. So what we have here is the American Hotel. Um, and these guys are gathered on the porch of the American Hotel while one guy reads the news out loud to everybody else. Um, what do the people on the porch have in common? They're all white. They're all white and they're all men. Someone said they're all white and rich, but they're actually definitely not all rich. It's, um, it can be hard to see this from our vantage, um, but this, this image of the guys on the porch is a very exuberant celebration <clears throat> of American diversity. Um, these guys, people usually laugh when I say <laughs> These guys are actually rich and poor. They're city folk and country folk. It's quite clear that not all of them know how to read. That's partly why the news is being read to them. Um, some of them are figured clearly as immigrants. Um, they're young and they're old. The, the American Hotel is a capacious hotel. It has a big porch because by 1848, unlike anywhere else in the world in the history of, of, of the political arrangements under which we live, all white men can vote. And that's an extraordinary expansion of the suffrage, um, extraordinary by American standards and extraordinary by any other standard. So in many ways, it's, a, it's really a celebration of Jacksonian democracy, this image. But can anybody see this figure over here leaning out the window? You can't, it's hard to see her. Okay, so there's a white woman with a headkerchief on um, leaning out the window. She's not on the porch. She's trying to listen. Like she wants to hear that political news from Mexico. Why would she be in this portrait, in this painting in 1848? Does anyone know? Yeah. Seneca Falls Convention. So 1848, uh, you know, not too, not all that far from here, the first women's rights convention where women demand the right to vote. So this, in addition to a celebration of Jacksonian democracy, is also acknowledging women are trying really hard, white women, to get on that porch. Um, but then the thing I think is most interesting about this image, if you see these two figures here, an African-American man and a child, it's not clear whether it's a boy or a girl, but that the child is in rags is making, is making it completely obvious that these are people who are held in bondage, right? This isn't, these are not free African-Americans. We're told that this is, this, this is a, a slave father and his child. Um, they're not allowed on the porch. They really care about the war news from Mexico. It's going to affect them more than anybody else. Um, and the thing that's so fascinating to me, they are in red, white, and blue. They are actually an American flag. Um, it's a really interesting, uh, just sneaky, really, I think somehow sneaky, um, really interesting challenge to the American political order um, a very long time ago. We know that challenge is made in so many other realms, but. At first glance, you're going to go, oh, I don't really care about that painting. But actually, it tells a really interesting political story about who we are as a people, uh, whose land it is, uh, who belongs here, how we rule ourselves, and who is ruled, and who are the rulers. Um, a few years after this, by 1856, you get the first of these political maps. My guess is this map looks really familiar to you. Like, un like you'll be unnerved by how familiar this map looks to you. But this is the first time political maps were made in this way, um, where they divided up the country and colored different parts of the country according to their political commitments. Like we have our red state, blue state, CNN political map, which weirdly looks a lot like this one. Um, these are the free states that have abolished slavery. California has just entered the union with the compromise of 1850. These are the slave states, and the green are states that have not, or are territories that have not yet entered the Union one way or the other. Um, this is a map who's attempting to argue that civil war is inevitable unless this is resolved, right? These, these maps are produced specifically to um, advance a political conversation. Um, they're often abolitionist maps whose point is this, this is an untenable situation, this is an irreconcilable 
conflict. Um, they do actually a lot of political work. If you think about your country as divided into blue states and red states, it does feel like you're about to fall into a civil war. Um, there are a lot of other ways to think about even this particular conflict, but um, the, the war comes, Lincoln uh, declares emancipation in 1863, and then in 1864, the war is still going on, uh, slavery is effectively over, um, and we get this portrait uh, of Sojourner Truth, the great abolitionist, uh, a former slave herself, who is depicted here, this is a photograph, this is the first photograph we've looked at, uh, really important change. Um, but in many ways, she's represented herself here, she's fashioned herself as that very allegorical figure of slavery that is just completely common. People would recognize this as, this is the iconographic figure of slavery, but this is a person who has escaped slavery and who has fought for emancipation. And it is a celebration, in fact, of emancipation. And the way I think of it as a celebration of emancipation um, is because of what's going on with her knitting. Um, so Sojourner, she looks, at, this looks like, like, oh, what an adorable grandmother. She's knitting like baby booties or something. Um, but if you look more carefully and look at the knitting as it's laid upon her lap and the skein of yarn as it trails away from her, I don't know if you can see this immediately, but think about this as the Great Lakes. And then you can go over to Maine, down to Florida, Louisiana, and Texas. It's the sneakiest <laughs> of all the images I'm going to show you. I just think it's so, it's a really deep claim. I mean, think about those hand prints on the caves. But this is, this is my country. I made this country. Not only am I free, I don't represent slavery. I represent freedom. And I also represent, we built this country. It's mine. It's not merely a claim of citizenship. It's not a celebration of American diversity. It's not a celebration of American division. It is actually a claim um, to, to being the country. She is the country. Like She has made herself here um, into America. Like She has transformed that figure of slavery into the figure of America um, in this one incredibly subtle move. I think it's just a really forceful set of claims. Okay, so I'm gonna move over here now because we've passed the Civil War. That was the midpoint, is the projector. Um, of course, what happens after the Civil War uh, and after uh, emancipation is a new regime of <clears throat> racial hierarchy, the regime of Jim Crow, 1870s, the year of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, and what the South, the former Confederates, Confederates in the South do uh, is essentially overturn emancipation by establishing a new racial regime uh, of Jim Crow segregation and um, vigilante terrorism. It is also aided by the 1870s um, in eugenic pseudoscience. So here, um, this was in a magazine, it's much like Harper's magazine. Um, here we have that Lady Liberty figure that should be super familiar to you by now. And then we have the different uh, highly racist contortions of that figure. Um, it says here, if you can't read it, what is she to be, to what complexion are we to come at last with our goddess of liberty? Um, it's an argument against racial mixture. It's an argument against immigration. Uh, it's an argument against citizenship. It's an argument against citizenship for native peoples. Uh, it's an argument against what would have been called racial amalgamation. Um, it, is a, it is essentially a, a claim that what is wrong with the United States in 1870 um, is that not everybody here is, is, is white. Um, so we see by the time we get to the uh, post-Civil War years, um, this graphic representation where we, we very often now will very often see this kind of sexy version of, of Lady Liberty. Here she is going across the continent uh, this is a celebration of westward expansion, and you see the native peoples fleeing as if the, what's, what you can, the, the motion here is she's bringing progress across the continent, bringing liberty across the continent. The train is bringing its uh, technological progress across the continent. So are the pioneers and all the various westerners, um, while uh, the natural world and native peoples who are often barely separated from the natural world um, visually here, flee, uh, flee from progress and flee from liberty and th flee from technology. Um, you see a lot of this during the era of the Plains Indian Wars. Um, by 1881, the United States passes for the very first time an Immigration Restriction Act, um, the Chinese Exclusion Act. 
which is being here in this political cartoon indicted. Um, the message here is that um, China is just finally uh, dismantling the Great Wall of China, but former American, former generations of American immigrants are being hired to build a wall on the Pacific coast. So that um, this is a, the, a very early representation of the idea that America would build a wall. It's an indictment of building a wall. It's not a celebration of that. Um, that era of immigration restriction, though, is also marked by the celebration of immigration, especially uh, on the East Coast, and the, the, the Statue of Liberty, the Liberty becomes this important statue, but on the West Coast, which is where immigration is being restricted, because the Chinese immigration is coming um, from the Pacific, uh, there's a kind of counter-proposal, which is not, not a proposal, but it's just it's like, if, if we were to have a statue in our harbor, it would be to warn um, Chinese that they are not welcome, right? That, that's the opposition to New York's statue. By the 1880s, with this highly racialized uh, and the weird sort of pseudoscience of this new scheme of racism, there's still this, this image of, the, of liberty with our liberty cap here. Um, I just want to sort of, this is the kind of great age, age uh, the great age of imperial expansion. The United States is going to become involved in a war in the Philippines. Uh, the British Empire is, is reaching its height here. This is a kind of weird imperialist image. This is a jigsaw puzzle or a dissected map where weirdly now Lady Liberty is showing the former America, um, this indigenous figure, um, where, the, where the boundaries of the land are. Uh, it's actually a sort of deeply creepy, weird image. Um, I'm just going to go quickly through a few more to get us up to the present. I said we were just over here now. Um, this is a cartoon that um, is making fun of populism. Populism in the 19th century was a thing of the left, but populists are here represented as a, uh, a lot of hot air in a patched together balloon. Um, we have, there's a whole culture during the progressive era of indicting monopolists. So there's an indict, indictment of populists, but there's on the other hand, indictment of monopolists here. It's like essentially Mr. Monopoly before the game of Monopoly. Um, that Lady Liberty uh, continues into the 20th century as the icon of the suffrage movement. Now, Lady Liberty has been bound by the tyranny of men, and she's trying to break free of her bounds from the tyranny of men. Um, we often think of the United States by the beginning of the 20th century, when we picture it as a mass democracy, it is increasingly an anonymized group of people, right? Like, we don't see specific or allegorical figures. We see something like this, Henry Ford's plant, which is a kind of anxious representation. Of how will that be a democracy, like, if we're all um, just these, these um, pieces of, of, of mass-produced uh, uh, citizenry? The uh, mass democracy creates a new wave of anxiety about immigration in the early 20th century. Um, this is an, a political cartoon not about building a wall, but about uh, establishing a funnel to bring in only those Europeans who meet um, eugenical requirements, which is in fact the law that uh, was passed in 1924, the National Origins Act. If we jump ahead to the Second World War, for the very first time you begin to see um, America thinking of itself as a superpower uh, that is abundantly represented in American comic books. So weirdly to me, Wonder Woman, you can trace a very direct line from Wonder Woman, who is essentially Lady Liberty. Um, she's defending democracy. You can trace that all the way back to that America Vespucci awakens a sleeping America. Um, it's a weird embodiment. But then weirdly, Captain America is, is also America Vespucci. <laughs> Captain America and Wonder Woman debut at the same time, but they, they, they update for a pop culture, for a new generation, a new idea of what the United States is, um, and that it is, it is super powerful, right? So this, it's, it seems like when you look at Wonder Woman, this is a 1940s thing, but has a very, very deep history. I, I can think about a lot of um, we could all probably picture a lot of works of 20th century art that represent the people in a new fashion. This is a beautiful panel from Jacob Lawrence's migration series about the great migration of African Americans from the Jim Crow South to other parts of the country by the millions, the largest migration in American history. I think of it actually also as a map of the continent, a little bit, they're sort of possessing the whole of the continent. There's this uh, claim to, it reminds me a little bit of that Sojourner Truth image. By 1942, if you remember that image we looked at with Queen Elizabeth with her hand on the globe? I think of this as the, the follow-up to that. Here's FDR uh, picturing the post-war liberal world order. Okay, the world got bigger, um, but his, his relationship to it is, 
is just as profoundly ambitious, right? Like it's a deeply ambitious portrait about the role that the United States will play globally after the Second World War, partly on the strength of its ideas, but also on the strength of what FDR called the arsenal of democracy, the tremendous manufacturing output uh, and economic might of the United States. The war also brings the age of the modern computer. Um, the general purpose com computer was invented by the Allies during the Second World War for military purposes and then becomes commercialized so that by the time you get to 1952, the first commercially available general purpose computer, which was built for the Census Bureau, is used in 1952 to predict the outcome of the presidential election. Here's a very young Walter Cronkite reading this, this I would argue, we'll say, how is this an image of America or the people? This is us. We are now bits of data on a computer printout, right? Like that is what the computer revolution means when the Census Bureau um, has a bit of data about each of us in this computational format and can tabulate and cross tabulate and do things like predict elections using that, using that data. You can see that same sense there. This is right of that year of Sputnik 1957. These are some MIT engineers studying their own computer printouts, but almost having like an Atlas-like obligation to, to bear the burden of the world. This is a kind of really powerful for me image of uh, somehow now MIT engineers, computer scientists are going to take on the burden of whatever the liberal world order is. A really strange moment in American history, but one that kind of explains Google. Say, <laughs> um, this is, it tells us a lot about um, the direction that the United States is, is going in. It creates an enormous amount of anxiety, both um, the seeming automation, uh, the fear of automation, the fear, the rage against the machine, um, some sense that there was, there's an extraordinary amount of conformity and also a hidden set of divisions. So 1961, the civil rights movement, uh, which has very, been going on for a very long time, comes in to the view of ordinary Americans. Jasper Johns makes this really moving map of the United States, which the, the states seem to be bleeding. And there's a sense of chaos and disarray um, and great fragility, a very different vision than any that we've seen before. The 1960s, of course, all kinds of people begin to question or are able for the first time to publicly question and with influence question the story of American history that many of these early images that I've shown you have told, but instead to insist they have left out the stories of Native peoples, the stories of immigrants, the stories of African Americans, the stories of women. And the story of America gets to be infinitely more complicated and it becomes, I think, in many ways harder to tell as a single story, especially by 1970, uh, in the year, which is the year of the Kent State shootings. You'll recall that in the, this is the 50th anniversary of Kent State, on May 4th, when the Ohio National Guard shot four Kent State students, the majority of Americans blamed the students. We think of that now as, you know, kind of, a, we, I think our a, a suspicion would be what a tragedy that was. People thought of it as a tragedy, but they blamed the students. Um, uh, so here's an anti-war, um, basically a flag, um, a silkscreen flag that made in California in 1970. Um, but here's the counter. Um, to, to the Vietnam, anti-Vietnam War movement, um, which is a kind of retrenchment around uh, a different story of America. That, those slides I showed you at the beginning where there's like two possibilities, um, either we're making America great again or, or we, have to, we have to change America, we don't go back to the past. That starts really in 1970, right at that kind of Kent State moment. There are some d um, detours, like the environmental movement that asks people to think about the world differently. Um, did not think in terms of nation states. The bicentennial in 1976 becomes a really conflicted place for arguing about what is the country, what is our relationship to it. Here's a, a folk art quilt um, by an African-American quilter from Alabama. Um, I'm gonna skip this slide because it's too complicated and we're gonna run out of time. The, remember to think about for a minute how much the internet presented itself, it seems so long ago now, 20 years ago, as the solution to the divisions in the United States. All these things would be solved. Um, by, by being wired. We would become one country, uh, which is the promise of Wired magazine. Um, there were a lot of uh, people who were not persuaded of this. This is an incredible piece of public art um, by the Korean-American artist Nam Joon Paik. It's this giant map of the United States full of video monitor, video um, 
uh, screens that are blasting information about the state. And you can't, no matter what you do, how close or how far you are from this work of art, you cannot understand a word. Um, it's a metaphor for the early internet that everybody is screaming and no one is listening. A lot of what we've seen in the last decade, um, you can trace out. Um, if you look at these images now, I think they have, you can, I hope that you can see behind these images a, a, a long history. And my point has been to try to convince you that when you look, look now at American political expression visually, uh, that it is often emerging from a very tortured and complicated past, and you might understand better what's going on um, when you think about the history of similar representations, even including protests of the wall or those CNN political maps and what they do to us politically to look at and stare at so long. And I just finally want to end with um, this image, which I really love and I think sums up beautifully as a work of public art, uh, the nature of our current dilemma. It's a piece called Double America by the African-American artist Glenn Ligon. And he always said that he was inspired in the series of works with this title um, by Charles Dickens's tale of two cities, the opening lines. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. That we live in a country now where it seems quite impossible for both of these things to be true. Everything that looks to be right side up to you looks to someone else to be upside down. What do we do as a people, as a state, as a nation, when we live in a world that actually looks like this? So thanks very much. I note that your lecture was uh, titled America from the beginning to the end. Are we at the end? <laughs> no, we're not at the end. The title is mostly just a joke. When I first was going to write this book, These Truths, um, I was going to call it American History from Beginning to End for dumb reasons. A, I hate subtitles. Um, B, I thought it was very funny. And see, the book is narrative, it's a story. Um, but I had no sense that I was, because it was doomed or over, um, it was like a once upon the time, like if you would call it. Um, and then, um, then Trump was elected in 2016 and I realized that seemed like a partisan dig, which is totally not what it was. <laughs> um, so, but it's okay to call the lecture that. Uh, I'm just going to let the microphone wielders do the calling on people. Your wonderful cavalcade of, of map making puts me in mind of our protean map maker grasping the sharpie. And <laughs> Are all the questions going to be about the present? This is a lecture about the past. With our, you know, the, his rendition of Alabama. I'm wondering if um, this is an indelible mark that's been made on our history, or if, in the light of of the you know the things we've been through, that uh, this shoot this too shall pass. Yeah. So um, I often say that when you get your PhD as a historian. Marilyn's going to back me up on this. You have to take an oath in blood that you will not predict the future. <laughs> right? Right. We're just really not supposed to. Because what the hell do we know? We actually, like, it's actually, it's, it's not a predictive science. Um, I appreciate the uncertainty. We all share the uncertainty. Um, I think that's not a question that can be answered for quite a long time. Um, we're looking at a you know, if you think of an X and a Y axis, where time is on the X axis, we have a plot that I think is very up and down in terms of the progress of equal rights, um, racial justice, um, prosperity. Prosperity pretty much just goes in one line. Standard of living just goes in, in one line, like better public health, like, but, but other things um, that are more um, variable, um, 
tend to tend to move in complicated directions. Not to say we're not in a much better place in terms of racial justice, you know, than in the past, but we, we could just be looking at noise on that curve right now. Depends where we're going next. So it's really hard to, it's, that's why the sort of pulling back and looking at the whole long history. I mean, one thing that I tend to say to people, people often ask this, there are three questions, I'll, this, we'll save us a Q&A. There's only three questions that ever come up. They're all a version of this question. One is, um, has it ever been this bad? Um, who can we blame? And the third one is, can you save us? <laughs> And um, they just really all sort into that bin, those three, those three bins. And the, I'm just gonna speak to the, like, has it ever been this bad? Because it's a version of your, your, it's not exactly your question. I'm trying to historicize your question. And the thing that I usually say about that is, um, one of my kids asked me recently, if you could have been born in any different year, what year would it be? I was born in 1966. And I said, uh, not before 1950, because, um, the care in a maternity ward before 1950, I would not choose, right? Like, it's just like an obvious question to me. Like, I, the idea that they're like, I, there's not really a... <laughs> he wanted to be born because he wanted to grow up with 80s music. So he was like, I want to be born in 1971. And I was like, you're a weird kid. Um, <laughs> but, so the idea that like, things were, I don't know, things are not good now, like I would say, infant care, neonatal care, like these are things I really care about. Um, and that's not a political answer, but politically, before 1965, the United States is not effectively a democracy. Um, remember, women can't vote until 1920. And before 1965, black people in the southern states can't vote. Like the percentage of people in Louisiana who vote before the Voting Rights Act, it's like 3% of black Americans. So. Um, has it ever been that bad? Well, it was, it was way worse. At least, so, or if you're only really comparing now against 1965 to the present. I don't know. This was, was pretty, Kent State was pretty bad, right? Like, I, I'm just not sure, I just don't see, like, there's more, we're pooling our panic because we're all so deeply networked that everything looks way worse. It's like we're in this Petri dish together, like bumping into somebody who's saying, I think it's bad, do you think it's bad? Oh, I think it's bad. Whereas like you could used to be able to just go about your day thinking, ah, what am I getting for dinner tonight? Like, it's just like you can't kind of go two minutes without wondering how bad it is. Um, but by a lot of objective measures, I just don't think, like I would, I would insist that there's nothing, there's not a day before the passage of the Voting Rights Act that is a better day for this country. Um, because we are all Americans, and it doesn't matter if it was good for the people who are your ancestors in a different way. It was not good for everybody, and that's what a democracy requires. So I just, having been born in 1966, like, I don't know, I think it kind of sucks right now, but it doesn't actually, like, compared to anything before 1965 for the nation as a whole. Sorry, that was a long answer, but I'll try to give shorter answers. Okay, here's a little one that's a little bit different. Uh, do you ascribe, do you ascribe to, uh, or what do you think of uh, Oswald Spangler's decline of the West and the 38th cycle of civilization? Do you think that, that we are in our winter of our cycle? Or do you think that, and the next great cycle, of course, he considered to be the Orient. Do you ascribe to that at all? No, uh, I take it that you do. Can you the, the question was whether I ascribe to Oswald Spangler's notion of um, the cycles of history that we are, uh, the, we, the West is in decline, that the next great culture to rise will be China, and we are in these kind of end times. Um, I, um, I just, I don't, I don't find patterns in history to allow for predictions in that sense. Like, in this, just sort of the way that I, um, answered that question. Um, I, one, if you think about, say, political science, um, quantitative political science um, purports to be predictive, um, but as a political scientist re re pointed out, as many political scientists, in fact, have pointed out, quantitative political science 
for instance, missed every significant development of the 20th century. The rise of the civil rights movement, the end of the Cold War, none of those things were predicted by quantitative political scientists who were trying to detect patterns uh, in large bodies of data and make predictions like Spanglerian kind of, which are, which are not quantitative, but have this kind of meta claim. Um, I just actually, I, I don't think that we can know what's coming next. And um, I, I'm not, I'm just never persuaded by those cases. Not that one as against any other one, it's just that move, that intellectual move. I, it's just, it's like a thought experiment. It's nothing more than that. Yeah, and that was uh, quite a variety of images you managed to choose from uh, cartoons to political cartoons to uh, comic books and paintings. Can you talk about how you uh, discovered and chose those? Not just Google Images, I hope. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I chose this set of images for this particular lecture because they do a certain kind of analytical work. Um, I teach American history as a survey class. So over 13 weeks, you know, I give 26 lectures. They're all illustrated. This is a subset. This is like a, like a quilt sampler or something, like an embroidery sampler of the, I, you know, I have hundreds and hundreds of slides that I use to talk about change over time. Um, so this is just a selection of those that narratively work kind of as a shorthand. Um, some of these are in my book, These Truths. Most of them are not. Um, I just think it's, it's actually, um, I, I like to use images when I teach. I think they, especially if you're trying to cover a lot of material quickly. Um, I also find, as a matter of pedagogy, people remember images. I will often hear from people after a lecture like this, be like, I've been thinking so much about that American hotel painting. Like, can you show me where, I forgot what it is called. I really want to look at it some more. Um, it, it has, they kind of stick with people. Um, so I, I like to do stuff that doesn't involve pictures too, but uh, I don't know. Maybe you guys didn't think it worked, but like, I, I think it, it has a kind of, um, has a, a value. It also allows, I think, allows us to be in a conversation together um, because we are all inspecting the evidence. If I were to get up here and just tell you my theory of American history, you're just listening to my theory of American history. I've shown you a body of evidence that supports my theory of American history in some, some way. And you can say, I don't buy that, what she said about that American hotel war, from, war news from Mexico. I wouldn't read that image that way. And that's the point of studying history, right? Like you're supposed to make your own evaluation of the evidence. So it's a way to show your hand um, as a scholar, to bring your evidence to bear. I could have brought textual evidence, um, but it's easier to get up to speed. Like you're all historians now, like you, you, could, you could talk through these slides yourself. In your survey course, if you were just gonna use historical novels, what would be some historical novels you would use? What do you mean historical models? Novels. 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 Yeah. Oh, novels. Having written a historical novel, I never teach with historical novels and I don't think they should be used to teach history. Um, I, I, once, I once advised a dissertation about why it is that people think it's okay to teach history with historical novels, because um, it's not. <laughs> They actually answer. It's kind of a long, I, I have nothing wrong with historical fiction, um, but the work of training people in the field of history is to teach them the methods of historical inquiry. So if I were teaching chemistry, it's quite important to understand the periodic table and to learn formulas. It wouldn't be very helpful to study uh, alchemy. Um, and it's kind of a similar relationship. Um, there's a method to the work of a chemist. It's a method to the work of a historian. It's completely different from the method of a novelist. Um, can we just make sure the next question is a, is a woman? So we've had a number of men. Just, uh, it's just a rule. It's just a rule I have. Nothing about anybody's questions are great questions. We're having a woman. This is. Hello. Um, Hi. My question was, what advice would you give to aspiring young writers and historians? Um, are you one? Yes. Okay, that's awesome. Um, uh, I don't know. I often, like, I, I, um, I think it's really important to write all the time, more or less incessantly, um, and to ask a lot of questions. 
um, and to practice getting answers to the questions that interest you. Um, to, I think that we, this is no slight to higher education, but I think in the humanities we have a tendency to think that our, our work, even in history, is to make meaning of things, and that we're just battling over meanings. I don't, that's not what gets me out of bed in the morning. I don't, like, I don't wanna offer a different meaning to something than someone, I actually wanna find something out. <laughs> like I like to get an answer to a question. Why is this this way? When did this start? Who's responsible for that? <laughs> um, so like when you have those questions, try to answer them and then try to write something about them. Not, I think the mistake that people make is I need to get something published. You would, would be great, but actually you're not gonna deserve to get anything published unless you've done a lot of finding things out and writing about them because you wanted to. Um, the, getting them published will come if you get good enough at doing it. I'm sorry, there's a question up front that she's been waiting for a while next, next time around. But yeah. Is it me? Um, yes. Sorry. So I thought that was really interesting that you really focused on a lot of the social progression that we've made um, in terms of rights and stuff. A lot of what the discourse today is, what's become hopeless is that our government tells us lies, that the discourse is broken down, that there's been you know, a complete upturning of what we consider the norms of the Constitution, et cetera. How do you feel about that? So, because I, I got your whole thing about the upward trajectory of health and everything, but what about those things? Yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate that question. Um, I do think um, there is what I, think of, we might all agree, is a kind of epistemological mayhem. It's hard to know things or to agree on how we even know things. Um, and I, I think that extreme polarization is a problem. If we can't agree about basic matters, right? Like people say, also, we can't agree about basic matters of fact, how can you have political discourse? This is a problem. And um, I do think that actually is a fairly new problem. So, uh, nor am I hugely optimistic about its immediate solution. On the other hand, um, one of the th patterns that I draw out in my long book is that every time there's a revolution in um, technologies of communication, like the printing press, the telegraph, the, the radio, um, it introduces political disequilibrium because um, all of those revolutions in technologies of communication um, both accelerate communication and expand the community of people that are communicated with, right? Since we live in a democracy that is about communication, um, they tend to diffuse political power. Um, it tends to be kind of a populist response. Like the, the, it's a kind of more of a people's movement after every revolution of technology of communication. And then there's a, it's, there's a lot of disequilibrium. And then there's a, some kind of return to some kind of equilibrium with a new political settlement. Um, so I think we're still in that disequilibrium. Right now, I don't know what the new political settlement would be. Um, but I, I'm so interested in the exact question that you raised that I'm on leave this year and I've been spending the whole leave working on a podcast um, that's coming out on May 15th, but it's a long 10-part series. It's called The Last Archive. And it's, um, it's a whodunit. It's like a 1930s radio drama like Orson Welles. Um, and but the who done it is who killed truth. Um, so each episode kind of goes through the 20th century to ask like, well, where do our forms of anxiety about hoaxes and frauds and fakery come from? What part of that is postmodernism? And we, if we're looking for people to blame, we can blame intellectuals from the middle decades of the 20th century. What part of that is the conservative assault on the press? What part of that, you know, what, what, how do we understand the origins of this? So I could give you a long structural explanation, or you can listen to the podcast, which answers the whole question. <laughs> <laughs>